Imagine stepping on a flight for your holiday across the Atlantic and finding out that your pilot has no access to live weather data to warn him or her about potential storms in your path. Would you be comfortable stepping on that plane? Or imagine investing some of your money, buying stocks, but you only had access to last month's financial data. Would you be confident in your financial decisions? Now, it's hard to imagine making these decisions without live or reliable data. And I'm sure none of us ever want to be in these kinds of situations. But I hate to break the news to you. We're all on that plane right now, not knowing what's ahead of us. And we're all making these important decisions with obsolete data. What I'm talking about are polls. Polls promise to be a reflection of what we think. But the industry has and has been repeatedly failing to deliver. The Scottish referendum, UK general election, Poland's election, Israel's election, the Brexit referendum, and recently Donald Trump winning the White House. Time and time again, we're all being let down by inaccurate information. But why should we care about polls and their failures? Well, polling is a scientific tool used to help us stay connected with public opinion. And when they fail to deliver, as they have done in the past few years, the consequences are disastrous. And disastrous not because of which side wins the election or which side wins the argument. Disastrous because that uncertainty creates societal stress and instability. Now everyone knows that polls are failing to work. In less than 24 hours after the UK's last election day, the founder of YouGov, Stephen Shakespeare, tweeted, a terrible night for us pollsters. I apologize for a poor performance. We need to find out why. But not much has been done to figure out why, and so far the search has been in the wrong place, and it's all turned into a blaming situation. The social media gets blamed for decreasing engagement for pollsters. Older generations get blamed for not adapting to new technologies. Younger generations get blamed for being disengaged with societal issues. Shy voters get blamed. Undecided voters get blamed. But what I realize in the middle of this blame game is that we forgot something more fundamental to the whole process, something simple but with huge implications and something unique to our time that we've gradually evolved into. Now, polls assume that our views are set in stone, but here's the secret. Our views are not set in stone. Our views can change. And our views may change not always abruptly, but our views may change as we know a little bit more. Now, I want to share with you a classic ethics problem known as the trolley dilemma, which I'm sure many of you have heard. But I want to repurpose it here and for you to be aware of each decision you make as you know a little bit more. Now, imagine you're the driver of a trolley or tram hurtling down a track and you have no brakes. Now, straight down the track, you see standing five people. Now, as you get closer, you see there's a fork in the path, and on the left-hand side is a track that leads to only one person. So if you end up continuing straight, you end up killing five, but if you turn left, you only kill one, so what do you do? And many of you will say you'll turn left, and maybe some of you will continue straight. Now what if, as you got a little bit closer, you saw that the one on the left is really just a child? What would you do now? Maybe some of you might change your mind. Or what if I told you that one on the left, that child is actually terminally ill? What would you do now? It's complicated, isn't it? Now our views only make sense with the context around them. And as the context changes, our views may change with it. Now, I know this is a hypothetical situation, and in everyday life, we're not asked to give our views about ethical questions. So let's go with a real-life example. You're a car rental business owner near an airport, let's say Heathrow, and you were told that if a Heathrow expansion bill passed, you would have to relocate your entire business. Obviously, you're not happy to hear about this. But today, when the council opened up the plans for public viewing, you realize that not only do you not have to move your business, but you'll end up in a prime location when the construction's over. So our views can change 
as we know a bit more. The same scenario with Brexit. You may have voted to leave when you're more sure about the world's existing order, but many now argue if the world is still in the same order as it was, with President Trump questioning NATO and its role. In Scotland, you may have voted to remain in the UK when the UK was still part of the European Union. But with the UK leaving the EU, many now say there should be another referendum. Now, some politicians say it's your right to be able to change your mind. And other politicians say it's an insult to your intelligence if you ask to change your mind. Now, whatever the case, it's up to the politicians to decide the solutions to their problems. We're here to talk about public opinion. Now, of course, whether it's a right or an insult, I say a different thing. I say it's natural to change our minds. And in reality, we do it all the time. It's in our nature to physically adapt to new environments and mentally adapt to new information. And as Darwin said, it's not the strongest of a species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. So you might be thinking, if we're always changing our minds, how can we reliably measure public opinion? How can we ever make any sense of it all? And you're right. It's a different situation now. But public opinion is not the only phenomenon with a dynamic nature. In 1885, King Oscar II of Sweden and Norway decided to celebrate his 60th birthday by offering a prize for the following mathematical challenge. Can we establish that our solar system will continue to work like clockwork, or if at some point in the future will the Earth just spiral off into space and disappear from our solar system? Now, to simplify things, Henri Poincaré, a French mathematician, began his work by considering a solar system with only two objects. This system and their orbits were shown to be stable. But the trouble started when the third object was introduced. Now, by working through this problem, not only did Poincaré win the prize, his three-body paper and subsequent papers laid the foundation for what we now know as chaos theory. And chaos theory not meaning randomness, but chaos theory meaning that a change, a small change in the initial parameters of an experiment does not necessarily result in a small change at the end of the experiment in a dynamic system. But like many mathematical theories, it was shelved for many years, until in the 1960s, Lorenz, a meteorologist at MIT, accidentally observed chaos theory in one of his experiments. He was running multiple simulations of a model to predict weather forecasts, and when he changed one initial parameter ever so slightly, that slight change created a completely unexpected result in the outcome of his forecast. Now, he later published a paper on his observation that we now commonly know as the butterfly effect. Does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? So let's think about it. If a stable two-body system became vulnerable to small changes as soon as that third body was introduced, what makes us think a virtual space where the minds of millions are continuously interacting is not vulnerable to these small changes? There's seven billion of us with seven billion views. Views that may change as we know a little bit more, or views that may change as we have a little bit doubt, or views that may change as we have a little hope, depending on our day. And these small changes are the flaps of a butterfly's wings in a complex system of public opinion. Mathematically speaking, where each view can affect millions of others in a split second, these changes cannot be ignored. So as you see, the problem is not the pole itself. It's the condition in which we apply them. Because we're dealing with a dynamic system, the pole is only good for that one moment. Because the next moment, something else is going on. And by the time the results are published, they're outdated. You want your data to be as close as possible to the present. You wouldn't look at last month's weather to figure out how tomorrow would be. So what are the experts doing to catch up with this ever-changing entity? Well, many experts now are taking polls more frequently, but taking more polls doesn't work. 
millions of pounds are being spent on series of polls to measure public opinion this way, but like disjointed wings unable to fly, these studies produce unrelated snapshots, even when collecting data on the same subjects at the same time. So what are the tools that we have then? Well, millions now prefer using social media, a great bottom-up platform for exchanging views without waiting for anyone's permission. But in social media, you can end up in ongoing discussions and endless debates without ever knowing the numbers on either side. Donald Trump's executive order on immigration is now one of the most discussed topics in social media. He's tweeting, his followers are cheering, and his opponents are arguing. But when it comes down to it, to show your numbers on either side, you still have to pour on the streets, and millions still have to sign petitions. So how do we know what people think before we reach these breaking points? Well, our democratic society doesn't have a tool for public opinion as a reference point. Public opinion becomes the interest of this or that party every four or five years. But the reality is we don't stop having views when pollsters stop asking questions. Four or five years is too long to wait for pollsters to ask us again. It's only been six weeks after the inauguration of a president and a democratic election in America, and already thousands are on the streets and millions are petitioning. Four or five years is too long to wait to be asked again. We need a new tool built from a new vision. That same vision that revolutionized top-down elite media with bottom-up platforms like YouTube, that same vision that revolutionized so many of our industries by sharing our cars on Uber or sharing our homes on Airbnb, that same vision for creating Wikipedia by putting together the things that we all know. And this vision, it's not just my vision, it's our vision built from our new values. Those values where we don't always have to wait for experts to fix things. And those values where we can make better things by simply collaborating. And we do this because this is who we are. And we're doing it again. We're creating a platform for live public views for everyone, not just special interest groups, where these butterflies can flap their wings, where you can say your views as you go, where you can change them as you wish. And so we stand at a crossroads now, and we have a choice. We can continue to ignore the problem, sit around in total darkness, and wait for pollsters to show up once in a while, and take snapshots of us with their cameras to tell us who we are and what we want. Or we can finally take that camera, turn it around, and take the biggest selfie ever. Thank you.